Hey, everybody, what's going on? What's hot? What's hip? What's happening? What's shaking on you Tuesday? I hope it's a good one for you. Second day of the week. They say Tuesday is the day that more work gets done at workplaces in these great United States than any other day. Yeah. Sunday Jenna is here, and we got a lot of other awesome people here, too, that have been popping up in those chats. Uh, today, I'm going to tell you about Rowan and Martin's laughing. It's going to be awesome. Uh, Julian Zeezer with the, that thing there that the kids use that mean this, this is good. This is good. Uh, Joker is here. Hamhead is here. Lyndon is here. Karen Garvey is here. Uh, Toby McGroby is here. Gilman is here. Peg Leg Vet is here. Captain Mauser is here. First one in the room, of course, though, was the great Ronald Bateman, who has been to the condo for Bushmills. Just want that up front. Um, Chef is in the house. He's there in Union Station making them fancy pizzas that people like so well. People saying hi to each other because, of course, we do have the most cheerful chat room on the entire Internet. You know what else is uh, you can like, share, subscribe, retweet, bell notification, all that stuff. It's all free. If you can do that, man, you'd really be helping us out. And, of course, we're monetized now, so you can feel free to uh, super chat. And make sure it's in the crawl here. Make sure and turn on those gifted memberships because, as I said yesterday, I, there may be some gifted memberships still hanging out there that nobody's claimed because they didn't turn on their gifted membership. So there it is, youtube.com slash at Tom Gully Show slash allow underscore gifts. Do that and it may pay off for you. I can't say for sure. It might, but it might not. Uh, Hamhead said, great line earlier, Joker Fish. I must have missed that. Cheerful chat room. It is the most cheerful chat room. Reverend Wild Bill is here. He says, Ayo, Reverend Wild Bill's here. That makes me immediately think about the fact that I had a wonderful conversation with fellow Ball State graduate, The Wolf, today. And uh, I'm always in a good mood after that happens. Ronald Bateman, hello, guys. Hello, Stone Green host. I am Stone Green. I just have to explain what that means in case people think I'm smoking that wacky tobacco, which I'm not. Not even a show has three ratings for show hosts that stream shows on the internet. Green, which is the very best. Orange, which is meh. And red, which is, this sucks. And I am stone green. I, I will always be green forever. Forever green. I'm the only one, to my knowledge. Um, Hamhead says, good times, good times. Hugh says, oh, hey, Tom. Oh, hey, you. Uh, Lucas Malago is here. Love Lucas Malago's avatar. Sven Dunkel has returned. Long time no see, says evening, guys. He's either in Germany or Amsterdam. We don't know, and he's building a boat. A yacht. Forever stone green. That's me. The wolf says, speak of the devil. Here I am. Of course, one of the wolf's many mottos is, when things are going bad, the only thing you can do is make them worse, as bad as you can make them. <laughs> he lives by that motto. Hey, Kahuna's here. He says, hey, gang, Kahuna, I just, before the show started, got your messages on Twitter, and I sent you one back. I just went to bed, so I didn't get your messages. I wasn't upset. I just, I just went to bed. Uh... Evening Wolf, people saying hi to the wolf. We got a couple more minutes here and then we'll get into our topic, which is laughing. Um, Joker Fish saying hi, people saying hi. Whoa, 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 whoa. Karen Garvey also saying hi to some folks. I guess I could have put this in the show later on, but I was going to play some clips of laughing and I decided against it. And the reason why is, you know, StreamYard's not that friendly to me lately but the bigger reason is you can actually watch laugh-in for free on tubi on pluto i think maybe plex there's a whole bunch of the free streaming uh app channels you can watch it on tubi i recommend i watch a lot of stuff on tubi i watched uh, the batman 
damn, last last night on Tubi. Um, I'm in Limburg painting my mom's house. Well, that's got to be a piece of cake compared to building a yacht. The wolf says, hello, brother and sister out there in the front row. <laughs> that's right. Out there, yes. Hey, everyone. Uh, the Big Kahuna. SG Fanboy is here. SG Fanboy, man. He's been so generous to this show. He's a great guy. And uh, I appreciate it. I so appreciate it. Uh, Joker and Hey Dupa. And uh, love time. Man, oh man. Captain Mauser, you just can't resist. Just, just, just trying to do the show before the show, can you? That, that, that's starting to get you in a little bit of hot water here with me. I, I mean, during when I'm doing it, fine, but man, I'll tell you what. Uh, Kahuna says, hey, Sunday. Oh, hey, Sunday, Jenna. Sunday, Jenna. SG. Um, Reverend. Anyway, whatever. The very interesting. Oh, there, there's the wolf's motto. Whenever you're in a bad situation, you must do everything in your power to make it even worse. Uh, Sunday Jenna with green hearts, pink clovers. Sven Dunkel says, Greeting, Reverend Bill, my brother in crime. Yeah, you guys are all a, a close knit band of folks. All right, I guess I better open up my thing. Maybe Captain Mauser resist the temptation to do the entire show before I get into this here. I'm sorry. It just cheeses me off a little bit. I sit here and do all this research and everything else, and people just start, you know what I mean. You know what I'm talking about. Just, yeah, we know, you know things. We know, we get it. Wait, wait until I'm doing it. And then, then do it. Uh, Rowan and Martin's laughing. All right. So, this whole thing started in January of 1968. Now, laughing was designed to be a very lightly structured, like almost no structure. And boy, did they deliver on that. A uh, program mostly of short comedic sketches. But if you watch any of the episodes, and you can see some on YouTube, but but I strongly suggest that you watch them on Tubi or something else. It was almost non sequiturs. The jokes were one line, and they were conceptual, and they were quick. The, the number of jokes that hit you in this program is just staggering. Uh, now, some of these became bits that would reoccur throughout the series, and uh, some of them were kind of sketch comedy that the cast members made up and then kept going. Uh, in other things, though, the cast members and the guest stars, and the guest stars are off the hook famous people, uh, would just appear as themselves. They, they wouldn't be playing a character. They would just be themselves. And sometimes they would be reacting to a previous sketch or they would be talking about the show or something that happened to them that day. I mean, it was just totally unformatted, okay? Now, these guest stars, biggies, and I'll get to them later, biggies, I mean biggies, were completely unannounced. You never knew who was going to show up on Laugh-In. And some of these guest stars... <laughs> would would show up multiple times throughout the season. If they got one of these big stars in, they would shoot a ton of little bits with them, and then they would sprinkle them out through the rest of the season. Um, but rapid fire cuts, camera movement, rock and roll music. If you remember the um, Austin Power movies, where sometimes in between parts of the plot, it would be just and people dancing and stuff and then back to the movie. That's what he got that from laughing. Totally. So the show always started with a bunch of quick sketches and then Gary Owens would introduce the show. And it was even that was sort of weird 
because he was always in front of he was in front of a microphone just like I am right now. And he would go live from Burbank laughing. And he had his hand on the side of his ear like old time radio guys used to do. And they had a thing called the joke wall, which was a giant psychedelic wall like the one behind me. And it had little doors in it and the doors would open. People would pop their heads out and they would tell jokes. So Gary Owen, who was a famous radio announcer, he would be very, very straight, you know, and he would do these weird sort of uh, connective statements during the show. Like he would be earlier that evening, which had absolutely no context in the show at all or whatever. Uh, that character that he played, though, became hipper and hipper and hipper as the show went on. And it's important to remember that Laugh-In was all about hippies, flower power, uh, counterculture, all of that. But it was popular with mainstream people because the jokes were funny and they didn't take themselves too seriously, maybe as a counterpoint to the Smothers Brothers. So after more sketches leading in and out of the commercial break, Rowan and Martin would walk in front of the crowd, introduce the show, and have a dialogue. And th these guys were almost like Abin Costello in the sense that Dick Martin was a wiseacre. He, he would pretend to be stupid. He, would, he was single-minded. He just wanted to party and make out with chicks and stuff. And uh, Dan Rowan was very much the straight man. Okay, so normally Dick Martin is frustrating Dan Rowan by derailing his attempt to introduce the show via misunderstanding or uh, a weird story that would have like 9,000 different turns in it. The guy on the left is Dan Rowan. The guy on the right is Dick Martin. And this is early in the series. The reason you could tell that is Dan Rowan grew a hipster beard later on in the show, and uh, Dick Martin didn't have quite as much hair. Uh, eventually, Rowan would end the introduction and invite the audience to a cocktail party. Now, that was a live-to-tape segment that had all of the cast members and some of these surprise celebrities dancing before a 60s mod party backdrop, delivering one- and two-line jokes to each other while they were dancing and partying, okay? So it's like, uh, my uncle shot an elephant in his pajamas. How'd the elephant get in his pajamas? This weird stuff like that going on while, and you did not know. You would see famous old time Hollywood stars. You would see very famous politicians, rock music stars, Ringo Starr guest hosted one time. I mean, it was a big thing. And then they would do a thing called Mod Mod World, which Rowan and Martin would introduce. And basically, that was just film clips of some of the female cast members, mostly Judy Carn, who is a British actress and was probably at the time most famous for dating Burt Reynolds, and Goldie Hawn. This is where Goldie Hawn got her start. And she danced as a go-go girl with little designs and sayings all over her body in bikinis um, and the, the camera would periodically zoom in onto things that were drawn on their bodies uh, and then there was usually a musical number based on the topic of that show performed by cast members and at the very end of the show every time and you know Randy Ramos does it here with me they used to do it uh, you know, uh, Burns and Allen used to do it. Uh, but say goodnight, Gracie. Goodnight, Gracie. Well, say goodnight, Dick, to which Martin would say, goodnight, Dick. And then that would go into the final joke wall segment where all the cast members popped out of the doors. And that was normally done as the credits rolled over the whole thing. So... At the very end, Gary Owens would do something again with his little radio thing, comment on things that had happened on the show. And then, very famously, Artie Johnson, who was the German soldier, Wolfgang, with the German helmet, and he would say, 
very interesting and then go back behind the leaves of the bush that he was in and then once in a while he would say very interesting but stupid that would be the end of the show okay that was it that was it so there i mean i can't begin to tell you uh all of the special guest stars that they had but some of the special guest stars repeated. They were there a lot, like almost every season, because they thought the show was funny. Okay? Here's one such guest star that appeared a lot. John Wayne. Perhaps the most no-nonsense guy in Hollywood came on. He's dressed as a giant bunny rabbit here. Okay? Uh, by the way, here's uh, Goldie Hawn and Ruth, Ruth Buzzy. Goldie Hawn was uh, a big deal. And I'll get into a little something that happened to Goldie Hawn while she was a cast member of Ronan Martin's Laugh-In. Here's some people that would appear on the show out of nowhere with no announcement, no pre-billing at all. Jack Benny, Johnny Carson, Carol Channing, who most of you won't remember, but she was a famous Broadway star. I hated Carol Channing. I never liked her, but whatever. Tony Curtis, Jamie Lee Curtis's uh, father. Uh, Sammy Davis Jr., Phyllis Diller, Barbara Feldon, who was on Get Smart, uh, Zsa Zsa Gabor, Peter Lawford, who later became Dan Rowan's son-in-law and was... Uh, a, sort of related to the Kennedys, Rich Little, Jill St. John. Oh, Jill St. John. Ooh, hubba hubba. Uh, Tiny Tim was on a lot. John Wayne, as I mentioned earlier, Flip Wilson, and Henny Youngman. But we'll get to some other people in just a second. By the way, Tiny Tim and John Wayne. John Wayne came on the show to meet Tiny Tim this is a famous thing that happened on the show is John Wayne went to shake his hand and then pretended like Tiny Tim's grip was so overpowering that it crippled him to the ground. So there you go. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. There, there's some things I could tell you for the people that are super duper interested. Okay. Uh, by the way, Lorne Michaels, who is now in charge and has for decades and decades been in charge of Saturday Night Live, was a writer on Laugh-In, okay? Uh, there's other famous people that came out of that writing group. I don't know that you'd recognize them. Only nerds like me would. But there's something about the post-production of this show. And it was shot at NBC's Burbank facility using two-inch quadruplex videotape. Okay, so computer online editing had not been invented and post-production video editing was achieved by a very risky method, which was cutting that videotape, not like film where you can see every frame, they would cut the videotape with a razor blade and then tape it together. Okay, so they had a master tape, they'd make a copy of it, and they would cut up the copy. Here's the thing. When the series was being restored by a cable network called Trio in 1996, those edits became a big problem because there was a lot of what they called jump cuts where you go from one thing to another with absolutely no transition. Uh, the adhesive tape that was used on that show 20 years earlier, having been stored for so long, made those edit points unusable. So they figured out a way to get around it, but that's just to show you how kind of 1968 to 1973, when the show was on, how primitive all the things they were doing really were, but they were doing really inventive, imaginative things, okay? Now, here are some of the famous recurring sketches on Laugh-In that became part of the cultural lingo of the time, that everybody knew what they meant. The first one is Sock It To Me, okay? Now, Sock It To Me uh, was a sketch with, I'll show you, just Judy Karn is there in the middle. 
And there's Rowan and Martin, of course. Uh, normally, Sock It To Me involved Judy Carn. And what would happen is someone would trick her into saying Sock It To Me or something that sounded like Sock It To Me. Like, uh, it may be rice wine to you, but it's sake to me. When she would say that, or when really anybody in the cast would say that, they would either fall through a trap door or be hit with a bucket of water or assaulted in some other benign manner. And that phrase, sock it to me. Sock it to me was kind of a bring it on, give it to me. Sock it to me also had a slightly double entendre meaning to it. You know, sock it to me, baby. Um, a lot of the cameo superstar guest stars would just say, sock it to me. And then they would, they would cut to that, boom, sock it to me, boom, on to the next thing. That's all that. And then you'd go, was that John Wayne saying sock it to me? But the most famous one, the most famous sock it to me, was uttered by none other than presidential candidate Richard M. Nixon. Uh, most of the guest stars that did this didn't get assaulted or anything. Certainly Richard Nixon didn't. But Richard Nixon's is great because he just goes, sock it to me? As if, as if that's something no one would ever possibly do. Uh, another thing they would do all the time, which is, man, this was just corny and funny, and that was the Farkle family. Okay? The Farkle family had a ton of children. They all had bright red hair and big giant freckles, similar to their good friend and trusted neighbor, Ferd Burfel. They had the funniest names on the laughing. Their neighbor, Ferd Burfel, who the joke is that he had fathered all these children on the side. And the sketch employed this diversion humor, uh, paying more attention to what the next person said kind of thing. And they were alliterative, alliterative excuse me, it's going to be tough to get through, uh, tongue twisters. That's a fine looking Farkle finger you found there, Frank, and things like that. Dan Rowan was the father, Frank Farkle III. Joanne Worley and a couple others played his wife, Fanny Farkle. Goldie Hawn played Sparkle Farkle. Artie Johnson played Frank Farkle IV. Ruth Buzzy was Flicker Farkle, who would only say, hi. That's all she ever said. Uh, two of the children were twins named Simon and Gar Farkle. And those, those were always played by characters of different races. Uh, so the Farkle family, they would always tell a long sort of diverted story during the Farkle family uh, section. Here come the judge. Here comes the judge. Here comes the judge. This actually has a long background. And eventually, uh, there was a British comic who started it. And then there was a, uh, another guy that did it for a while. And uh, then Sammy Davis Jr. took it over. The Right Honorable Samuel Davis Jr., or Right Han for short. Uh, Davis would in introduce the sketch with spoken verse, like, if your lawyer's sleeping, better give him a nudge. Everybody look alive, because here come the judge. And he would strut off chanting, here come the judge. Here come the judge at the very end. And this, this, this is something that people would say, here come the judge. Um, Laugh-In Looks at the News was a big deal. It was a parody of network newscasts. And it was introduced by the female cast members in a highly unjournalistic production number, usually. Let me see if I can find another photo for you here real quick. Um, no, I've been burning through them pretty, pretty, pretty good here. i got to save that one for later. Oh, by the way, here's... Tom at the age that Laugh-In first started. Why don't I just leave that up for a second? I know you guys love to make fun of that. Um, so the sketch was originally called the Rowan and Martin Report, which was a takeoff on the Huntley Brinkley Report, the big NBC news show in the evenings. The sketch itself, though, featured Dick humorously reporting on current events, which then segued into Dan reporting on. And these are hilarious. 
news of the past. And they would show a past event and put their laugh-in take on it, which was always funny. And news of the future, <laughs> which is just a funny concept. And on two occasions, news of the future correctly predicted future events, kind of like The Simpsons has done uh, several times, one of which being that Ronald Reagan would be president in 1988, which in 1968, that's a tough prediction, uh, and another that the Berlin Wall would finally come down in 1989. Now, this segment inspired Saturday Night Live's weekend update. And of course, as I mentioned, Lorne Michaels was a laugh-in writer. So uh, there was a sports guy that came on and he did some funny stuff, one of which was called, he would take video clips of normal everyday events and turn them into sporting activities. And this one, I think, might have been my favorite one of all time. It was called Cannonball Catch, which uh, featured a backwards film of a bowling tournament where the cannonballs or bowling balls are caught one-handed by the bowler after rolling up the alley which was which was uh pretty funny uh another one was called new talent time which was later turned into discovery of the week and that would introduce a variety of oddball acts sometimes regular cast members would play these oddballs but sometimes they were real people kind of predating the gong show one of them tiny tim Another one, Paul Gilbert, who you might know better as the father of Melissa Gilbert, half pint from Little House on the Prairie. Uh, another sort of running deal of new talent time was a 6'2 actress named Inga Nielsen. And she was a bugle slash kazoo player that can only play one note of the tiger rag. But Dick Martin would always put the moves on her. And Dick Martin would also hate he always hated the new talent acts except for her for whom he was wildly enthusiastic which was kind of funny um Artie johnson played a character named peter rosminko was looking for a big american break and i personally feel like yakov smirnov stole his whole shtick a guy named murray langston was on murray langston later became the unknown comic a thing they would always do was the Flying Fickle Finger of Fate Award, which would recognize dubious achievements by public individuals or institutions, usually people in the government. And the trophy was a, a gilded left hand mounted on a trophy base with uh, two small wings on the, on the fingers. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, there was another segment, and I love this one. It was called Questions for the Audience slash Dick's Costumes. So in the sixth season, Dan Rowan would ask the audience if anybody had any questions about the show. So he'd be in front of the crowd. Has anybody got any questions how we produce the show or how things go along? And before he was able to do it, Dick Martin would come out in some weird costume and then the whole thing would be about the bizarre costume he was wearing. He'd be in a Viking outfit or a chicken costume or something of that nature. So the people on the show and the characters on the show, uh, Dan Rowan was uh, one of the hosts, Dick Martin, of course. Dick Martin also played a character, uh, a drunk named Leonard Swizzle. And he was the husband of the equally drunk Doris Swizzle, Ruth Buzzy. And Dick Martin was always trying to get on an elevator, but the doors would never open properly. They would open sideways or close when he tried to get in. Gary Owens, radio studio guy, you know, earlier that evening or after the explosion. And there was no explosion. He would just say things. Uh, Artie Johnson. I don't know if any of you ever saw Artie Johnson on game shows or in movies or Love Boat or anything like that, but uh, <clears throat> very, very gifted uh, character actor. And he was Wolfgang, the German soldier, who would, was a potted palm, and he would be very interesting, but stupid. And he eventually closed each, each show by talking to Le Lucille Ball and her husband, Gary Morton, as well as the cast of Gunsmoke, 
Both of these aired opposite of Laugh-In on another network, and he would also talk to whoever was on ABC. Laugh-In was on NBC. So it was, it was this show where people just threw all the rules out. You would never be on the show that was opposite you in the lineup. Well, they did for, for uh, uh, you know, for Laugh-In. Uh, as Captain Mauser was saying some half hour ago, uh, Tyrone F. Horny, supposed to be horny, uh, was a dirty old man that would always try to put the moves on Ruth Buzzy. She played a character, a frumpy, ugly woman called Gladys Ormphy. And she'd be on a park bench and he would sit down next to her and say, would you like some candy, little girl? Or some other just disgusting thing. And she would end up just beating him senseless with her purse. Um... There's other characters that he played. Ruth Buzzy played a tremendous amount of characters. Ruth, by the way, I think lives on a ranch here in Texas now. She was Gladys Ormphy. She was Doris Swizzler. She was also Kim Hither, an exceedingly friendly lady of the evening, commonly seen in sketches or at the cocktail party, propositioning people while leaning against a lamppost. Uh, <laughs> she's just... Uh, yes. Henry Gibson was like a, a, a sort of a soft-spoken poet character. Now, Goldie Hawn. She's best known as the giggling dumb blonde, stumbling over her lines uh, when she'd try to introduce news of the future. She'd mess up her lines all the time. Uh, in the early episodes, she recited her dialogue sensibly in her own voice, but as things progressed, she got a sort of a dumb Dora character with a high-pitched giggle and a vacant expression and that endeared her to people and uh, she frequently did a Donald Duck voice for some reason that nobody can figure out but uh, they'd ask her to do ballet and do things and she would go into this this deal now Lily Tomlin was a big part of Laugh-In she played many 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 indelible characters this one here is called the tasteful lady who can't stand anything that is raunchy or, or not conventional. And there she is with, uh, I believe, Susan Hayward, who was a tremendous movie star. And uh, she played Ernestine, a very obnoxious telephone operator. One ringy dingy, two ringy dingies. Now, here's a thing that they started doing on the show that the censors never picked up on. When she was dialing the phone, she started dialing it with her middle finger. And so she would dial, and I'm going to use my index finger because, as you know, I, I know you want me to make it dirty, but I'm not going to make it dirty. So she's dialing, dialing, and she'd go, hmm. Well, she would leave her middle finger up, and the censors never caught on. They said, we know she's doing something wrong. We just can't put our finger on it. Uh, she played Edith Ann, which was a five-and-a-half-year-old uh child who would say things and then go and that's the truth uh she was the tasteful lady who you see before you uh she was dotty a crass and rude grocery store checker lula uh the babbler a character given to speaking exuberantly and at great length digressing every few words never staying on one subject producing an unbroken incomprehensible monologue uh judy karn was the Sakatumi girl, you know, splashed with water, conked on the head by a large mallet, knocked out by a boxing glove on a spring, all that stuff. Joanne Worley, who's been a little forgotten by time. She was a, a, a taller gal, and uh, I think she may have passed away, but she had like an opera voice, and she would just sing like crazy. And anytime anybody made a joke with a chicken in it, she would expect expressed just extreme outrage it, it drove her insane uh and she also and i she may be the one that, that invented this she would go boring and uh so she may have started that uh during the cocktail party she would talk about her never seen married boyfriend slash lover boris uh and that was her shtick uh, there's a variety of other people I could go over. Uh, for those of you who remember um, 
Hogan's Heroes. Larry Hovis was a writer for this show. He also was a cast member on the show. Uh, Richard Dawson uh, of Family Feud and all that. He was W.C. Fields, Groucho Marx. He also played a character called Hawkins the Butler, who always started his piece by asking, permission to... And then he would fall over. <laughs> he would just keel over. It's just weird stuff. Uh, Dave Madden, who played Reuben Kincaid on The Partridge Family, he would always throw confetti after what, what was known as a naughty thought. And this was a raunchy show, by the way. They would get relatively uh, double entendre sexual. And uh, after he would do this, he would throw confetti in the air and give this sort of, <laughs> did I say that look? Uh, so there you go. Let's see here. Um, okay. Here's a few of sort of the innovations. Um, some of the first music videos, you know, videos, and they weren't just a live performance, they were a story or something of that nature, were produced for network TV for Laugh-In. And the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, the, the Bee Gees, the Temptations, the Strawberry Alarm Clock, the first edition, these are relatively major music bands of the time, and they came to Laugh-In, and Laugh-In produced a music video for them. During the September 16th, 1968 episode, Richard Nixon, running for president, appeared for just a few seconds with the disbelieving, I told you about it earlier, vocal inflection, sock it to me. Uh, the same invitation to appear on the program was extended to Nixon's opponent, Vice President Hubert Humphrey, but he declined, which is odd because the Republicans, even back then, were seen as the more conservative people. It wouldn't fall for such tomfoolery. And the Democrats were much more in line with the thinking of the flower power sort of ethos of Laugh-In. Well, that's not the way it went. Humphrey declined. And Humphrey later told the show's creator that not doing it may have cost him the election. Nixon said for the rest of his life that appearing on Laugh-In is what got him elected. So there you are. Now, here's a bit about Goldie Hawn. Let me just put her back up for a second because Goldie Hawn back in the day was a looker and people would tune in just to see her in her bikini go-go dancing. Well, while Laugh-In was going on, in the third episode of the fourth season, she made a guest appearance. She had left the show for a little while. You know why? She did a little movie called Cactus Flower, and she won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress. So she comes back to the show, and she begins the episode as if that success has gone to her head. She's an arrogant snob. And then she gets hit with a bucket of water and she immediately goes back to being a giggling blonde bimbo type character, uh, which is hilarious, you know. And by the way, it shows the power of the program. A lot of people win, win Academy Award. They don't go back to their TV show. She did. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Republican or conservative politics or commentary, but on PBS, there used to be a show on, it was probably on for 30 or 40 years, called Firing Line, and it was with this conservative intellectual named William F. Buckley. And the people on Laugh-In tried over and over and over to get him on the show. Well... December 28th, 1970, Buckley finally appeared on Laugh-In in a, a departure for them. It was a sit-down segment, portions of which were scattered throughout the episode. And he's got Rowan and Martin on each side, and they are fielding questions from the cast, including Lily Tomlin doing her Ernestine and Babbler characters. 
and giving humorous answers to those questions. Now, near the end, when Rowan asked Buckley why he finally appeared to agree on the show, William F. Buckley explained that the creator, George Slatter, had written him an irresistible letter. He promised to fly Buckley out to Burbank on an airplane with two right wings. <laughs> yes. uh, and at the end, Rowan actually thanked him. Now, this is a guy that normally this show would make fun of and despise, but they thanked him for appearing, saying you can't be that smart without having a sense of humor, and you have one. So on the 100th episode, featuring John Wayne, Tiny Tim, and the return of many, 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 many cast members, Wayne, with his ear cupped like Gary Op oh, Owen, read the line, and me, I'm Gary Owen, instead of Gary Owen himself. So these guys were doing anything, trying to, and, and these big stars were willing to do it. They had nothing to lose. It was, it was that kind of show. Wayne also shook Tiny Tim's hand. I, I, I told you that, and, and he pretended, and I showed it to you, and I'm going to show it to you again. He pretended that Tiny Tim's grip was overpowering, and that's, uh, that's actually that actual photo right there. Uh, there's other catchphrases that came out of Laugh-In. <clears throat> Look that up in your Funkin' Wagnalls, which was a very, Funkin' Wagnalls was a low-end set of reference books, uh, and it had just kind of a funny name to it. So uh, Dick Martin would say, you bet your sweet bippy. That's another catch catchphrase. Flip Wilson, who appeared on the show a lot of uh, times, would say, ring my chimes. And beautiful downtown Burbank. That became a catchphrase, too, which was a tongue-in-chief reference. This Burbank uh, was a place in the L.A. suburbs that the NBC put their studios. It was not beautiful it was sort of ho-hum uh ernestine's one ringy dingy two ringy dingy uh and she would also say a, a gracious good afternoon this is miss tomlin of the telephone company have i reached the party to whom i'm speaking which is just kind of funny and she would uh, mispronounce the names of famous people gore vidal was called mr vedel william f buckley was mr f buckley <laughs> And uh, Richard Nixon was just Millhouse. Um, let's see here. Was that another chicken joke? That was Joanne Worley. Sock it to me. Uh, we've gone over that. Uh, Blow in my ear and I'll follow you anywhere. They would say that a lot. Uh, let's see here. Here come the judge. Very interesting. And that's the truth. Go to your room. That was something that Dan would say if somebody did something particularly egregious. Marshall McLuhan, what are you doing? Marshall McLuhan is one of the greatest media analysts in the history of the world. I'm a big uh, disciple of Marshall McLuhan. He came up with the uh, notion that mediums, mediums like radio and television, were either hot or they were cold. And it's, it's a long thing. Oh, Marshall McLuhan, we got to do an episode on Marshall McLuhan. I'm a I'm a Marshall McLuhan fanboy. Um, yeah, take your smoking hot girlfriend to Toronto and spend a whole day in the Marshall McLuhan carriage house. See how that goes over later in the evening. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, how does that grab you? That that was one. Uh, and another thing they would say is they would refer to somebody suffering some horrible plight, and then they would say, "And he was a much better person for it." Uh, <clears throat> uh whatever turned you on that was that was another phrase from the show uh let's see here uh, how would i know i've never been out with one that was sort of a misunderstanding joke they would do um so there you go uh there was a whole bunch of uh, merchandise uh tons of them tons of them <clears throat> there were uh, Bippy Burgers, That's a Chicken Joke Chicken, Fickle Finger of Fate Fries, because there was a chain of Laugh-In restaurants. Beautiful Downtown Burbank Burgers, Fickle Finger Franks, Very Interesting Sandwiches, I'll Drink to That Beverages, Sock It To Me Soup, I mean, tons of it. Uh, there was a humor magazine called Laugh-In Magazine. It uh, ran for a whole year, 12 issues. There were trading cards for Laugh-In. 
Uh, Letters to Laugh In was a very short-lived uh, daytime spinoff show with Gary Owen. Uh, there was a cross-promotional episode of I Dream of Jeannie that had Judy Carn, R.D. Johnson, Gary Owen, and uh, the creator, George Slatter, playing themselves in a story about Jeannie being sought after to appear on laugh -In. Um there was a horror spoof movie, which you can still see. It's got to be on one of the free channels called The Maltese Bippy, starring Dan Rowan and Dick Martin as low budget movie makers. Um, so there you go. DVD releases. There's been several of them. The complete series was released in June of 2017. They tried a revival of the program in 1977 which they did as specials. It was just called Laugh-In with a brand new cast. The standout of that cast was Robin Williams, whose starring role in Mork and Mindy about a year later prompted NBC to rerun those Robin Williams shows in 1979, two years after he did them. Uh, Waylon Flowers and Madam were, were on that. Kind of a low-budget action hero, Marjo Gortner, was on the show. Uh, and some others that are somewhat unremarkable. Critics, while noting that the show is great, groundbreaking, they've, they say that the show hasn't aged well. I would disagree. If you are politically hip, if you know history, if you know what happened, it aged just fine. Various aspects of this show also come across as a little racist, according to critics. Uh, other aspects, stereotyped, other people that are now seen as not to be stereotyped. Um, while the humor was appreciated at the time of its release, some people don't like it today. I, you know, it's a fine historical record. And I would say for the most part, it's just counterculture jokes. So um, it won a number of Emmys, Outstanding Musical or Variety Program, uh, outstanding Musical Variety Series, Outstanding Writing Achievement, Outstanding Individual Achievement in Electronic Production because of all that editing, Outstanding Musical or Variety Series, Special Classification Achievements, and that was for Artie Johnson, Outstanding Directorial Achievement uh, for one of the directors, uh, and that was the episode in Season 4, Number 7, the guest star was Orson Welles. Uh, and it was nominated just countless times, countless times. Uh, it won some best Golden Globe Awards, sorry, Best Supporting Actress was Ruth Buzzy in 1973, and Best TV Show, it won the Golden Glove for Best TV Show in 1969. Lily Tomlin, Henry Gibson, and others were nominated, but they did not win. So, the... Complete series is available right now on Tubi. Tubi. Uh, and I'm a big Tubi watcher. So if, if you have a Roku TV or you've got Google Chromecast or anything, even a phone that will get the Tubi app, it's available for you on demand. Uh, and like most TV series, you might not want to watch the first couple episodes. In fact, I'd skip to the beginning of the second season. Because then they're in full gear. They're, you know, they've all the kinks have been worked out and they're they're doing great things. But long story short, that, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of the groundbreaking, hilarious, and interesting show that was and is laughing. So now it's time to get to your comments. Uh your comments. Yeah. Let's get to those. Oh my god, there's a ton of them. Is there a show on right after this one? <laughs> I just have to ask that. I didn't see one when I started. I didn't see one. That didn't mean there isn't one, but I didn't see one. Uh, let's see. Let's get back to the beginning here. I got to go back to the top of the slot. Then I get to the back. Uh, let's see. There. Here we go. Uh, Lyndon says, can't wait to hear your story about laughing. A lot going on there. Boy, you got that right. People saying hi to each other, hi to each other. Your thing 
Please explain to yourself. Well, Peg Leg Vet, much in the spirit of laugh-in, I always say before the show starts, I better open my thing. Now, it is a double entendre to a very slight extent, but it really just refers to the information that I have prepared to do the program, and it's a lot more fun to than saying I better open this file. So, there you go. Uh, send them my way. Uh, Captain, no harm meant. Didn't mean anything by it. New to the show. It's okay, Captain Mauser. It's, look, it's me. It's not you. Me, it's not you. People frequently want to get involved and they're excited and they offer up information. I'm like, I wanted to tell everybody that. It's my show. Um, it's like we are a flock, says uh, SG Fanboy. Did you say flock, SG Fanboy? Did I hear you say flock? Well, in that case... Yes, it is like we are a flock. Yes, it's just exactly like we're a flock. And now StreamYard's going to hose me. I just, I don't know. I don't know why I pay for this. Uh, Gilman says, my wife just busted my chops for not knowing about Laugh-In. You give her a big hug and a smooch and say, honey, that's why I married you. Because you know about this stuff. And then if she says, suck it to me, you guys are going to have fun later. Um, Reverend Wild Bill says, Tubi has short adverts and get shorter the more you watch. I did not realize that. But uh, Kim Warfield says, hello, brother. I'm picturing a 13-foot wooden bo board off a 30-foot wave. Uh, yeah, but there isn't a... The wolf is physiologically incapable of surfing. It's a long story. Uh, rock on, Big K. People saying hi to each other. Very interesting. Rev, if you go through the Firefox, you can illuminate, eliminate all the adverts together. All together. Well, I didn't know that. I watch it on my TV in the bedroom. I do, too. That's where I watch it as well. 30 sec or less adverts isn't bad. No, they're not bad. They're not bad. Uh, I watch it on my Android phones. The Wolf has like 17 phones, so it works the same on the computer. It does work the same on the computer. I have just jailbroke fire sticks. Hey now, Reverend. Hey, look at you with your technology talk. Um, Sven Uncle says, where you hide money from a hippie, put it under the soap. Hmm. Some of Tubi's commercials are woke. Well, some of everybody's commercials are woke. Uh, John Wayne was on laughing. Yeah, thanks, Wild Bill. Appreciate it. Um, uh, it a hey, Christina Costello, I hope you are doing well, and I am glad to see you here. Here come the judge. Here come the judge. Thanks, Reverend Wild Bill. Kahuna, tell us about the future. Sven Knuckles is very interesting. Artie Johnson on the tricycle falling over at the end. Well, I didn't mention it, but there's a whole bunch of people that would ride bikes and do other things and fall over. Uh, we should all go to a Tori Amos concert. Hey, Brett's Hollywood show. The year was 1994. I was doing afternoon drive in Bloomington, Indiana. Now, I was on, um, what was it? AM 1360, WGCL. And I had a big sort of big wrap around news console. And I was looking out over Bloomington, Indiana. Now to, to my left, there was a big glass studio window like you have in radio stations. And in that studio was Jimmy Hurley. Hi, Jimmy Hurley coming to you from WTTS. And that was alternative radio that got into Indianapolis. And one day, his guest in that studio was Tori Amos. And I was smitten. Although she is this tall. But the whole show, I was like, you know, coming back from break. 17 minutes after the hour, you're listening to the afternoon edition here on AM 1360. Oh my God, Tori Amos is only 17 feet from me right now. She's an angel. Anyway. Uh, Tiny Tin came on and sang, sang Tiptoe Through the Tulips. Yeah, that's where Flip got his start. Well, Flip was on a lot of shows, but that's one of the places he got his start. I mean, Flip was on Carson and everything else. But uh, my mom grew up on laughing. She loved it. It's a great show. Take my wife, please. 
Well, that was another catchphrase on the show. Oh, that Henny Youngman, as if there's two of them. Uh, I met Tiny Tim in Marietta, Georgia at a craft show. And boy, is he tall. I don't, I don't think he is anymore. I think he's uh, no longer with us. I could be wrong. Damn, Lauren's old. He was probably super young when he did that. John Wayne in a bunny suit. Wow, didn't know he had a sense of humor. Oh, yeah, if you see the John Wayne clips from laughing, he's got a heck of a sense of humor. Uh, there's a story about John Wayne when they were making, um, getting ready to make Blazing Saddles. Mel Brooks sent him a script of the movie. He said, would you consider doing this? And John Wayne, he called, he called Mel Brooks up and said, partner, I'm sorry. I just can't do that. But I'll be the first one in line to see it. <laughs> Sven Dunkel says, I miss Mad TV. There's a little laughing in Mass T Mad TV. Me either. Deanna Marie says, I used to try to repair my cassette tapes like that. And you could. And your um, a tracks as well. Uh, one ringy dingy. Two ringy dingy. Um, pie to the face. Uh, sometimes. It was a lot more getting hit in the head with a giant fake mallet. Hit with water. Dropped through the trap door. And then a boxing glove on a giant spring. Uh, is this the party to whom I'm speaking? Are you doing the show in the chat? Is that what you're, are you doing? Are you, um, Richard Milhouse Nixon, uh, I don't know what that means. Uh, hello to Deanna Marie. Uh, I had the Nixon pin that had a cartoon face and two peace signs with his finger saying, sock it to me. That's funny. That's hilarious. I didn't know they had those. Hey, Captain Mauser, Richard Nixon, the man that cursed constantly in private. Well, yeah, I, I don't, I can't say anything about that. Tom, I see traits of Alfred E. Newman in your young pick. Oh, traits. It's a dead ringer. Uh, I would too if I had that job. <laughs> I think I, is that a, a laugh-in phrase? Uh, it sounds like one. Uh, what me worry? Yeah, Reverend Wap well, is laughing. I love the interviews with Monica Crowley about Nixon. And wigs. Uh, Houston, we have a problem. Aku is here. He says, hey, oh, I'm back from the future. That is next week. Tom, your detailed breakdown of the lingerie football league was great. Did I do that? I don't think I... Oh, 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 you're saying you're back from the future. Uh, uh, hold on. Lingerie FB league. We're going to do one on that, Aku. Um, too bad the women in that league are so unattractive. Not all of them, but 97.5% of them. Uh, Aku is back from the future that is he. Tom, that's a, that is a great comb over. This is a comb over? I don't got a comb over. I would expect nothing less from the gringo giant. That's the wolf's <laughs> nickname for me. And, and many Spanish-speaking people in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Ronald Reagan, your stream keeps going down. D no, it doesn't. Maybe at your house. I'd have seen that. Love in an elevator. La, 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 la. Uh, you probably couldn't do that now. No, a lot of stuff they did, you couldn't do that now. Um, let's see. Oh, wow. Um, 45, 11, interruption in the stream. I, okay. Rico at 9 Eastern. Okay, so we got some time. Um, thanks for the advice. Going to start on the second season. I was wrong. Rico at 8. Oh, so we don't have any time. Um, let's see here. Always like the show. I got two minutes now. Um, love that dog peg leg. Thank you for your service. Um he, Captain Mauser, Tom gets upset with me a lot for spoilers. You guys. What's the show about tomorrow? I want to research ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, make sure and put it all in the chat during the pre-show. Um, I haven't decided yet. It's either the superstars, Jim Brown, Jay Johnson, Marshall McLuhan, or the lingerie football league. I'll figure that out tomorrow. I got hired at Eli Lilly's as a chef today. I start sometime next week. Congratulations, Randy. That's a cakey gig you just got. Eli Lilly. Hey man, congratulations. Aku says downtime to Firefox is a choose on Ram. Not as bad as Google Chrome. 
Do it on your cell, Aku. Uh, Joker says 69 Pontiac GTO, the judge. And then there's another one that's the boss. Uh, 40, 14 stream. I don't, I'm not, nobody else is saying that. I'm good, Tom. I hope you are. I am, but I'm more worried about you there, Christina. Hang in there. I can't stand that woke crap. Um, I met Tiny Tim back in the late 70s. Futurama did a lot of laugh-in bits, according to Aku. Uh, the Wolf says, Joker, my brother and I turned a 1969 goat into a show car and showed it at Car Crap Magazine's event at the Indy State Fairgrounds. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'm going to get the rest of these comments, but they're going to have to show during the outro. You guys are the greatest. No super chats this time, but I don't care. You bet your sweet bippy I don't care. Um, go watch Shuli. Tell him Tom Gully sent you. Have yourself a spectacular Tuesday night, and we will see you back here for Hump Day. You guys are the best. Like, share, subscribe, all that stuff. Go get yourself some uh, merchandise like the stuff, and it's in the crawl, and it's in the description of the show. And with all that being said, the only thing left to say is, till next time, we will see you next time.